in fact rani ma'am even you can take the queries from youtube directly agar uh, after uh, just starting okay so we are live now we will stop i will let you know when when you can start Yeah, we are ready. We can start. Okay, so uh, you won't see participants here. Mostly participants will be on edX user. Yes, sir. Most of so, them are okay. on edX. Okay, just let me know when they. So, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, very uh, warm wel welcome to each one of you. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Rani Tokas, uh, one of the course coordinators of FIP six of Teaching Learning Center, Ramanujan College, University of Delhi. Delhi, welcome you all to uh, this uh, interactive session with Professor Shandar Ahmed, who is joining us from School of Computational and Integrative Science of Jawaharlal Nehru University, uh, New Delhi. So, uh, as you all are uh, well versed with the uh, fact that this faculty induction program. is being you know organized in collaboration with assam university silchar assam davanagri university karnataka maharishi markandeshwar university solan himachal pradesh islamic university of science and technology jammu and kashmir and um, well before i uh, invite professor shandar ahmed to deliberate upon the idea of uh, classroom itself initially and what is the future of classroom and perhaps this question is you know a very common to each one of us in the contemporary times of pandemic ever since you know uh, coming of this uh, uncertain uh, challenge in front of us and especially in front of karmia we all know that how many learners have been marginalized however the spirit of being in academy is embedded and has to be integrated you know, and has to be emerge you know even from you know within these testing times of challenges so uh with that uh, i am very very uh, you know uh, glad that on behalf of the whole team of ramanujan college teaching learning center the program director dr nikhil rajput and uh, other uh, respected faculty members i welcome you uh, professor ahmed and uh, well professor ahmed as i just shared is uh, is is the professor and scientist at the school of computational and integrative sciences jawaharlal nehru university new delhi and uh, well um, he belongs to uh, the old uh, delhi and is a very very passionate and enthusiastic scientist who also loves poetry both in urdu and english i'm also very uh, you know pleased to share that he was ranked fourth on list of best bioinformaticians in india and he got this best uh, 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 bioinformatician award in the year 2018 he has also been appointed as a research scientist at national institute of biomedical innovation and has won many awards for that he has published more than 100 research articles in high impact reputed international journals his thrust areas of research are bioinformatics biodata analytics and complex systems his research group has developed many bioinformatics software for various purposes such as binding site prediction dna shape or in direct read out prediction tools solvent accessibility and general structural structural analysis tools as well and currently his research group is engaged in developing data driven algorithms and applications of biological data the basic research interests are machine learning deep learning through neural networks big data analytics and novel architectures indeed it is a matter of pleasure to also uh, have somebody like professor shandar emmer who is uh, you know uh, along with his team you know is also uh, recently uh, you know came in news with uh, you know with the coming of uh, an app called techno metrics which is a very very uh, you know instrumental uh, 
which is instrumental in uh, evaluation and assessment process for academy across the world i would say because it's still uh, the team is working on it and it's going to come out uh, very soon and uh, so uh, indeed um, uh, so not uh, coming in between uh, sir professor ahmed and uh, my fellow learners here i would invite professor ahmed uh, for his deliberation on future of classroom technology analytics and content over to you sir thank you so much uh, thank you very much for a wonderful introduction it's always uh, pleasing to hear about your introductions in <laughs> sometimes you forget that you have been doing something useful and uh, Okay, okay thank you very much it's a very uh, cold morning in delhi uh, you are people are joining from different parts of the country and uh, i hope for, uh, through this interaction i'll be able to exchange um, some of the uh, coolness of delhi if i can uh, play between coldness and coolness so for some coolness from delhi and the warmth from the different parts and uh, we can through this integration we will be able to have um, better weather for both all of us is foggy but the fog is getting cleared gradually as the sun is rising and fog is also getting cleared on many other fronts in the country we are going to start the vaccination today and while i am speaking here the vaccination drive is about to be launched so this is a perfect time to um also look into our um opportunities diseases and the areas of therapeutics that the educational system requires i'll be just uh, covering a very small uh, dot on this vast map of uh, developments in the field of education and um, talking about what i feel uh, will be the future of classroom so uh, my stakes or my claim to be speaking on this topic is because i have been involved in teaching for a long time i have taught at almost all levels of education starting from the middle school uh and the secondary school and then the and university level and i'm gu guiding now the phd and post doctoral fellows so having an experience of guiding different levels of education and also in different areas of knowledge it is uh, always interesting for uh, or if it's, if not the if it doesn't make us an expert but it makes us then an enthusiast in the subject and uh, on the basis of that i uh, can justify my position to be here so i start with my slides so i when i say future of classroom i'll be talking about uh, the technological aspect the contents and the analytics aspect of the uh, classroom so the uh, in the morning we had a little uh, discussion about whether it should be future of classroom or whether it should be classrooms so it is the future of classroom as such the the whole idea of classroom that i am going to talk about not just the physical entity of uh, the ball room and so just to add to what uh, rani has already introduced uh, we uh, we collect our lectures recently we launched a youtube channel sciwi lab is the name of my research lab quickly speaking this sciwi is a play on scientific question and also a japanese word sciwi which means happiness so this is also an integration across so i i am kind of an unaffiliated or unattached uh, enthusiast of knowledge who hops from one language to the other and one subject to the other as a bioinformatics data scientist i am speaking on this education technology and the history of education and uh, this is uh, the overall theme of our school our school is called a school of computational and integrative sciences sometimes we think the integrative sciences can only be computational sciences because the no, the data are generated or knowledge are generated uh, through a various uh, through various processes in the wet lab or through the surveys or field works but the multiple um, collections of knowledge can only be integrated through a mathematical or even more specifically through a data science based model and therefore sometimes i call our school to be school of computationally integrative sciences instead of computational and integrative sciences so i take this liberty sometimes so this i start today's uh, discussion with a quote which was given by in 1925 and it said books will soon become obsolete in the schools a scholars will soon be instructed through the eye 
So a person who in, um, contributed to the development of a bulb uh, is apt to talk about eyes because eyes become important. And in this slide, I show you the second part where uh, Google Glass uh, has been high, um, demonstrated. So with the help of a Google Glass, you can actually see the world just in your, in, in your glasses or in a kind of augmented reality, the entire world can be shrunk. So this reality, which was uh, predicted in 1925 is very much um, around the corner. And the pandemic situation has brought us closer to the online education system, but there is more, much more happening in the field of um, technology versus education. And that has been happening even before the pandemic set in. I start with the cultural aspect of this change. So this is a Hindi, uh, actually Urdu couplet, which I've written in Hindi and it's translation on the right for those who cannot understand Hindi. So I just read it out. Hey, wo bhi din ke khidmate ustad ke iwas dil chahata tha hadiyaye dil pesh kijiye. Badla zamana aisa ki ladka sabak ke baad kehta hai master se ke bil pesh kijiye. So this is an indication of how a cultural transformation in the education is also happening along with the technological transformation. This is not to be seen in a critical way because this has all to be seen as a kind of um, uh, education is academics. We have to understand the situation instead of being uh, value oriented in this, we have to be um, professional and have to understand why this change is happening. That there was a time when a student used to dedicate his entire life to the teaching learning process. And today when the student comes to the class, he actually assesses whether he's getting the value of his money that he's putting into the course. So the value of the money is very important today. And the, as teachers, we have to be conscious and aware that the times have changed. We should not be uh, proselytizing or trying to uh, uh, idealizing our, our students. We have to give them what they actually need, what they have come, uh, come to us for. So every course we have to understand what are the particular objectives, goals of that particular class, particular course. And accordingly, we have to tailor it. So that is why the classroom has to change according to the requirements of the student who is joining the class. Further pushing this point, if you look at the history of the uh, education, educational process in a school, I've been talking recently and I'm collecting this some uh, pictures from this website that I have cited here, that uh, the main educational material until recently used to be these wooden blocks and bamboo uh, stick pens. And uh, there was a time when fountain pens were considered to be so taboo that if I carried a fountain pen to my class, my teacher used to confiscate them. And we used to always uh, envy the class at the, his Elmira and shelf where he was keeping the, all the pens that he had config, confiscated from the students. So times have changed now fountain pen, nobody confiscates a fountain pen and nobody uh, is writing on these wooden blocks anymore. But uh, this is how we grew up and technology has been uh, growing so fast, even within our lifetime. And if you go back a little more into the history of technology in the classroom, so I have just put a few landmark developments in the history of education. So in 15th century, the, there were these book, books called horn books, where uh, there were engravings of a summary of a lesson or some very brief information that were being distributed and people were being taught through these horn books. And then in about 17th to 19th century, this uh, invention of magic lantern came where you could put something, a precursor of a slide where the uh, graphics could be shown and on the screen, on the wall, and people could utilize it. In the 19th century, then the chalkboard was invented. You, can, you would wonder the chalkboard has been there forever. No, it was in the current form chalkboard actually came in only 1801. And uh, pencil was invented. After people came to know about some properties of graphite, then they started using this graphite for, for writing. And then this graphite was given a wooden uh, cover and the pencil in 19th century. So that's how the basic stationery or the basic items or technologies through which we can write, read, write, and transfer our knowledge developed. And uh, in 1930, again, not very long ago, it is less than 100 years ago, overhead projector came. 
And some of us may have used overhead projector and see how fast the technology disappears. Uh, it is now very rare to find an overhead projector like this. In the overhead projector, I, some of you who have not seen this, you have a lamp, big lamp here, and there is a reflector, uh, uh, mirror, reflecting mirror here. And whatever uh, transparencies are used here for writing or printing, and these transparencies are reflected on a screen. So these were very much part of the classroom. And I did for it very much know some of my teachers used to use overhead projector for their classroom lessons. Then uh, a very interesting technological and also conceptual um, um, revolution in the field of education came from Skinner when he introduced uh, what were called teaching machines, which was uh, the, who was the pioneer of what uh, he called the reinforcement learning. So this, this was the first step in, or in some sense, to personalize the curriculum or personalize the teaching learning process. So personalization is the keyword that I'll come back to again. And then education, if you look at a little more history, so the, these are probably the last uh, or maybe one more slide of the history if you are not interested in it. But the primitive education, the, the primary source, the primary um, site of imparting education or an equivalent of classroom in the 7,000 to 5,000 BC was home and environment. People were already learning security about how to survive, how to defend themselves against wild animals, against natural disasters. And conformity and transmission of tradition was one of the major objectives of education during that time. Reinforcement of superstition was also another important objective. In this Sumerian culture in 5000 to 4000, this uh, roughly, uh, the school was established and the reading, writing, mathematics, astronomy, architecture, arts, law, all these things, they started entering into the field of formal not, not really formal, but in a more organized way of reading, uh, learning, teaching process. And the early schools, which were primarily the sites for those schools were in temples, military schools, vocational schools, and the court schools. And they were evolving in India, Egypt, uh, Egyptian culture, Chinese, Hebrew, Spartan, Greek, all these schooling systems, they were teaching about public administration, science, medicine, dentistry of those times, law, arts, music, and the method of teaching was primarily imitation, memorization, and lecturing. And then the medieval times, uh, we may be more aware about medieval times and medieval times were giving mostly about education, about the moral and religious values, uh, chivalry, guild, dictation, memorization was the primary method of teaching and the, some ex kind of experimentation started in these times. And mathematics, science, philosophy, history were already, and so school was getting a little more formalized. So this is a source for this education information. Those of you who are interested in more of the history, and they can go to these slide shares, wonderful lecture that I um, saw uh, yesterday. So coming this also, we are to, since we are talking of future of classroom, so what is classroom to begin with? So this is the definition in Wikipedia that it says classroom is a learning space in which both children and adult learn. <clears throat> The classroom, why it is a classroom, is a classroom provides a space where learning can take place uninterrupted by outside distractions. So one of the primary purposes of holding a classroom in terms of the timetable and in terms of a physical space is to provide an environment where distraction can be avoided. And the traditional classroom, uh, so uh, I come to the third point later. So the, uh, we already wonder the, whether this uh, idea of having uninterrupted classroom really is visible, viable today, when people are not connected to the outside world through a physical connect or physical space, they are connected to the outside world through the smartphones, through the handheld devices, through the devices they are wearing, which you can't even notice where they're wearing. They may be wearing a watch, they may, which is communicating all the time with the outside world. They may be connected to an, a, gla a Google Glass, as you say. Uh, so uh, this is a challenge for the teacher to deal with this issue. Can, we, can a teacher really provide an uninterrupted environment to its learners uh, in the world, which is so connected that uh, it is hard to isolate an individual from the uh, world to which he is or he, she or she is interacting all the time. So this traditional classroom has been attacked by advocates of various forms of, uh, there is an idea of alternative education. They say that classroom is not the right source of education. You should teach students uh, in alternative methods 
uh, so for instance, Italian educator Maria Montessori has written, stationary desks and chairs are proof that the principles of slavery still informs the school. So that means the, the mere restriction or, or isolating a student, uh, as isolating a learner from the outside world is not really, there is a consensus that everybody wants that people should be completely away from distraction and they should learn on their own. Um, uh, in, in that isolated environment. There are views which say that there is, there's no need of isolating a student and they can learn while very much being in the uh, connected space. So the, uh, the direct experience or direct interact activities can be utilized. So there are uh, these uh, advocates of alternative education. So what actually now, if you go a little deeper, when we define a classroom, what constitutes a classroom? So we can look at these points and see how these different aspects of classroom are evolving and are likely to evolve in the coming years. So first is the physical walls, which is created by isolating and avoiding distractions as we were just talking about. And then uh, this, uh, I also mentioned, this is already demolished by internet because internet allows an individual to interact with the outside world, even if you have very thick walls and even if you have locked these walls and nobody can go out or come in. You can still lock classrooms, as they say, in the virtual world, but locking the classrooms still uh, does not uh, isolate an individual from the outside world. It only isolates the class as a, as a bigger concept. So uh, again, a classroom may also involve an expert teacher or a lecturer who is the basically a coordinator or who is the manager of this class. And the uh, uh, to, the goal, uh, the purpose of a, having a teacher there is to impart knowledge that he or she has an authority on. Now, in this aspect also, there is a complete evolution or complete transformation. So when we were uh, talking of a classroom or when we were talking of a teacher or a guru in, um, to a number of students, the guru was authority on the subject. And this, this student who was in touch with the guru had no other way to get, to, um, to go get that information even before the books were published. So any knowledge that he could acquire was through the teacher, lecturer, or guru. And uh, that is how the authority of teacher was um, established. But this is not the reality today. Now teacher is not the most learned or most expert person on the topic he's teaching. He's topping, he, a teacher who is teaching say to a plus two classroom or uh, even a senior classroom at the research level, is, is, not, uh, is not the only expert on the topic that he's teaching. And if a student uh, looks for the, that information on the topic that he's covering on the internet through Google search, there, he will find many much more useful and much more powerful and much more interesting materials online. So what is the point on the, that the teacher comes to the classroom and repeats what is already there on, in the internet? So a student can as well go there and listen to those videos and a student can even listen to the video of the same person who is teaching him. And probably if the teacher is repeating his content, what he has said earlier, it is not so much useful. And then, then um, the only way to keep the student in the classroom is some punitive measures by for enforcing attendance, by enforcing that uh, this person, uh, why you are not present in that class and be attentive. So these kind of authoritative measures Will not are not required. The student are not now. Uh, there, there is no um, uh, punishment and there is no penalty that the students pay because if they learn something, that knowledge is going to take them to higher positions in career. That the teacher's authority is weakened, weakened not only in terms of the intellectual uh, control of knowledge, but also in the uh, political power they uh, they uh, they carry. I mean, uh, until recently, a teacher's recommendation to a job, to a position employment, or a teacher's recommendation letter, even anonymous teacher's recommendation letter was, was critical for hiring. And uh, experts uh, in many countries used to value the recommendation letters very much. So I was working abroad and then the many recommendation letters which came from teachers were kind of treated as a kind of testimonial and a kind of uh, degree. But uh, now uh, we more and more we came across a situation when expert teachers are writing a recommendation letter what the student has given them. So a student comes to us, they say, I want a, re a recommendation letter on this topic. The teacher doesn't have time to write that letter. He says, okay, you go and write the letter, I will sign it. So it's, uh, the recommendation letters credibility has weakened substantially. So the teachers or lecturers authority 
uh, has been diluted, not only in terms of the intellectual uh, superiority that he enjoyed uh, compared to the people around him, but also in the influence in the society or in uh, the credibility in the society. So uh, the, uh, this is what a good teacher has to be conscious about and has to know exactly where he is positioned in society rather than cribbing about it. And uh, you have the third component of this classroom, which is about the students who are uh, willing to learn. So this is, if there are no students who are willing to learn, there can be no classroom. So, but then how can we decide what the students have come to learn from my class? So I, when we are uh, going, we start our MSc program, many times I get uh, uh, phone calls or emails from my students who are joining this course and they want to know what is the purpose of this course? Where this course will take us after we finish our master's degree? What are the job opportunities? Very few people ask whether I'll become a better person by joining this course. No, nobody asks you this. Whereas teacher thinks that his job is to make this individual a better person. So there has to be some kind of an agreement between what the student wants from you and what you want to impart as a teacher. And if the student has come there to learn, to improve his chances of getting an employment, to make himself a better, more useful citizen of the society and uh, get a better salary, and your, you are in your mind thinking that your job is to educate him about uh, ways of life, about how to deal with others, how to respect elders. So there is a complete disagreement between the two objectives and the classroom cannot exist uh, in this scenario because classroom is not there for teachers. Classroom is there for students and therefore it must cater to the needs and objectives of the students. And of course, it should also cater to the objectives of the education policies, which are set up by the authorities of the times. So uh, what are the objectives? So they want to make them interdisciplinary. Uh, there will be some value component that the governments, the authorities would want us to impart. So that objectives, we have to be aware about how to impart them in best possible way, how to bring about a reconciliation between the various demands from our profession. And accordingly, we have to modify not only the way, uh, the contents of our lectures, but also the way we deliver that lectures. So these are, some of the thoughts about what a classroom constitutes and how it is undergoing. So in terms of the classroom, we also have, every classroom has certain strategy of imparting education, how to teach it. So pedagogical activities, like some of sometimes very young children uh, in you know, some places still, they ask a student to read a book and the teacher is just listening. All the other students are just listening. And this is sometimes an effective way for the students uh, for improving the reading skills of a student, but then rest of the students at one time when one student is reading, rest of the students are not really participating. And a very uh, classical view of the uh, teaching uh, process uh, is le lecturing by teacher. So a teacher prepares a lecture and he just delivers it without having any uh, to and fro communication between them. So some of this uh, criticism, which will also be apply on the online education has to be un uh, understood first in the uh, traditional or classical concept of classroom, whether these challenges are only limited to online education or they have been there in the real physical classes also. So teacher sometimes demonstrates an experiment. And uh, if you are teaching physics or chemistry to plus two school or you are teaching it to the senior schools, you may have the uh, possibility of demonstrating this through an experiment and there are now experimentation and the critical thinking and, and designing the scenarios has become so common that even in social sciences and languages, there are many experiments that people perform and people have innovated those experiments. So the introduction of experiment in the classroom is a big landmark that has happened in the past and that continues to be there. So the one would wonder how can we do an experiment uh, when you are teaching online? So that uh, kind of this kind of questions uh, would in, uh, apply and we have to find solutions for them. And another way of uh, ped uh, pedagogical activity in the classroom that constitutes a classroom per se is the discussion and exchange of views. And in this, the, the teacher's role is to moderate these views or to connect uh, what are the um, different uh, if you have a class of 100 students, then you cannot have list, you cannot list 100 views. So teachers uh, job here is to collate the views, to cluster those views and put them together as a group of ideas. And perhaps uh, in some cases, if possible, also uh, give the correct picture of a concept that he is trying to deliver. Uh, and there, and another very important activity of the classroom, when we say classroom, we are also talking about the administrative uh, aspect of the classroom, how we manage our classroom, 
how we mark their attendance, whether attendance is compulsory or not, whether you are enforcing attendance, whether if a student is not attending the class and he or she is performing very well in your exam, are you going to fail him? So, uh, and uh, if uh, the student uh, comes to the class and uh, he or she is not really mentally present in your class, are you going to give him a very um, uh, reward for that? And the, this is the uh, uh, continuous process and the evaluation itself is also an administrative activity to some extent and the, in the evaluation process, uh, you uh, do a regular evaluation, weekly evaluation, monthly evaluation, semester wise or annual. So all this kind of and how, whether you do it through uh, proctored methods or without proctored approaches. In, uh, when, in my school, when I was studying uh, uh, in, during my high school, uh, my principal actually introduced an idea of examination without invigilation. So we were uh, asked to take our uh, answer sheets ourselves and write our exam and there was no invigilator, no proctoring. And uh, his idea was to introduce, introduce responsibility and mo responsible moral behavior among the students. And it really worked very well. We were not cheating when we were doing this. So uh, how do we do evaluation? How we incorporate the best practices of, uh, practices of evaluation into uh, our system, our classroom, that is also an important thing. So what is going to impact uh, our classroom, having highlighted these uh, few points uh, about what classroom is, let us look at this individually, not necessarily in that order, but overall. Uh, technology always alters the way we teach. Online education is the primary paradigm shift. We have been talking about online education so much, so I spent uh, pretty much good time to talk about things which are not purely online and how the educational uh, process is so, changing. Uh, so uh, before we uh, proceed further, there are some a couple of questions. Can we take yeah, that? Sure, yeah. That yeah. So uh, initially, uh, there is a question from uh, Dr. Amrendra Tripathi from uh, Patli Putra University. He says, uh, how printing technology changed classroom culture? That's what he's interested in knowing. And apart from that, there are three questions which are sort of, I would say, very relevant to what you have been reflecting for a couple, four or five minutes about the classroom culture. So Anuradha says that uh, what can we uh, say about the connection between teacher and students? How could we see that? And uh, Dr. Harmeet is interested uh, in knowing what is the most important and effective way to make classroom more interactive and vibrant. And there's uh, this another concern by Akash Anand that how do we achieve co-learning if classroom is only for students? Okay. So broadly, if I can group these questions, one is about how technology is impacting different types of technologies. So some of this I'll come in the coming slides. I'll uh, take you to some of the experiences that uh, I have put together. Uh, so I'll talk about how the technology is impacting our attendance system, evaluation system, and about teaching learning process. And a very important component in the technology here is the data science that I will uh, be talk, touching upon in, in, uh, indirectly and directly. So as far as the connect between student teacher is concerned, so the, actually the shocking um, point that I wanted to raise today, and that is what I have tried to do is uh, in a little, I have tried to to kind of provoke you is that a student is not coming to your class to develop a, a student teacher relationship. Uh, we are perhaps overestimating our role as developing a relationship. And uh, many times uh, uh, too much of a student teacher connect may be seen as unprofessionalism. So I'm, uh, uh, of course I'm making an overstatement. Uh, um, this is uh, basically to provoke you and to give you the other side of the story. So um, a student, uh, you have to understand what is the objective of your student uh, to come to your class. A student thinks that you know mathematics very well. And this student has come to your class to understand those mathematical concepts that he has not understood. The student doesn't care about how you dress. A student doesn't care about uh, whether you speak softly or you are harsh. So this may be an extreme view, but uh, this may um, depend, actual quantification of this uh, component may be different, but uh, we have to bear in mind what is the objective of a student to come over class, to our class. As teachers, we have to primarily cater to two sets of objectives. One set of objectives that have been set by the student and the curriculum that, he, that has been designed, and the other set of objectives that has been set up 
and those set of objectives may be already incorporated into the contents is by the authorities about what kind of um, policies we have to transfer to our students. Other than that, I may have certain ideology. It is completely against the professional ethics to transfer my ideology to my students. We have to be as, as professionals, as neutral to uh, the ideas uh, that we have uh, and the ideas the students have. So a student teacher connect as you are talking about is an emotional component that helps in, in that is acceptable and that is fine only to the extent it helps the teaching learning process. If it doesn't help, so some of these aspects help us in teaching learning process because some of the students who come from different social backgrounds, if we have some empathy from them, we can understand what are their challenges, we can tailor make our contents. So if we are utilizing that a student teacher connect to personalize the content, to, kind, uh, to give um, localized contents and individual attention to a student and therefore uh, thereby improving the teaching learning process, that is perfectly fine and that is welcome. But beyond that, a teacher should not overestimate his role. That is what I would like to say. Is there any un uh, unattended question here? Uh, there's another uh, concern uh, from uh, Dr. Gupta, Pavan Kumar Gupta. He says, uh, could you highlight, uh, you know, perhaps in uh, in the coming few minutes, I mean, he wants uh, you to highlight on the criticism of online education context, particularly in rural, uh, in Indian context, uh, where uh, more than 65% people live. So that's, he's interested in. Oh, okay, I'll come, I think my future slides are going to touch upon that. So I'll not comment it right now because I don't want to preempt myself here. That's it. Right, sir. Okay. So we before yeah just uh, before we started this lecture, we had agreed to take a little few breaks to give some rest to your mind, and that is why we I it is so welcome that uh, Dr. Rani has uh, interrupted and given us a little time to reposition ourselves and prepare your brains to look at my contents even more critically. You are welcome to do so. So we resume our... Yes, sir, please go ahead. So are you seeing my slides or? Um, yes, sir, it is visible. You're seeing my slides only? No, no other screen, right? Um, yeah, we can see your slides. Okay, just done. Okay, so um, online education. So we, this has uh, this is very much at the heart of uh, everybody, every one of us who has been affected um, intellectually and uh, professionally through the pandemic. But online education is not that has been brought about the pandemic. And online education existed, which came to our rescue when we were restricted to our homes. Imagine the situation we are sitting, our, student, our children are sitting at our home for eight hours, 10 hours, they have nothing to do. I mean, now the classroom is actually providing that opportunity uh, to continue the learning process. So um, now what happens, uh, I'll uh, come to the online contents again, but uh, the change in contents, when the classroom is changing, the technology is changing, our contents has to change. I said, I cannot keep on teaching what is already there on the internet. I cannot um, try to, <clears throat> if, um, if the same topic has been taught better by another teacher and it is very much been recorded and if there's, there are only, already online educational resources available on that topic, uh, what can I do? What is my place in, the, in teaching that topic? My place is that I should remove the repetitive contents and I have to personalize the experience of the students. And that is where, uh, as somebody said, a student teacher connect. So a student teacher connect has to be uh, modified in the context of making our teaching learning experience personalized. That is the real connect that we are looking for. We are not looking for a connect of an emotional nature, but also of a professional nature. That is, we know that this student has this background. This student knows how to, this student shares. I mean, if you are talking of school education, I know that this is a student who goes and shares uh, time with his father and who is a rickshaw puller. So this rickshaw puller is collecting money from the pe people who take the rickshaw rides. So how can I personalize his experience of um, collating the money the, the, uh, he adds through rickshaw rides? What is the experience? How the money is taken? How the money is returned? 
where he keeps the money, where he stores, three, three places, four places, where he stores money in his pocket, where he stores the money in some corner of his rickshaw uh, cart. So uh, we have to personalize this experience. We have to understand our students, where our students are coming from. Uh, so this is a very immediate context, but this is too trivialize, trivializing this whole uh, uh, topic. Personalized experience also includes ab about how, what, what is the history of my student. I'm going to teach them, say, artificial intelligence. So now my student may be coming from a background where they know how the brain functions. They may be coming from biology. My student may be coming from a background where he understands economics, but has no idea about uh, intelligence, the process, of, the definition of intelligence. And uh, my student may be coming from very different backgrounds and uh, understanding their background and personalize their, personalizing their content is the job of the teacher. And that is where the place of a teacher is. It, that, this is the kind of content which is difficult for an individual to find on the internet. The resources that he accesses, he or she accesses in the real time may not be tailor-made. Tailor -made. Now, this is a competition between a real human teacher and the machine teacher. The machine is also trying to do. So how machine is trying to understand your background, understand your experience, so what, how will a teacher know what is best for an individual student? Does he, before he goes to the classroom, does he have to do a research on every student? Is it feasible? Can, if I'm teaching a class of 100 students, can I really look into their CVs, their backgrounds, their skill sets, their marks they obtained from the, in their 10th class in science and all the subjects? And even if I have access to all that data, all that information, can I really make an intelligent decision about what should I teach this student? I can possibly not do it. This can be done only through some machines, through computational methods to personalize these contents. So they can take this data anonymously also and without uh, compromising to the privacy of the, um, of the data associated to individual students, they can recommend, okay, this is the student. We have profiled this student. The student has answered some questions and we have the data of this student, what he has learned, what courses he has attended whether a student knows how to drive. If he knows how to drive he will, uh, a car, he will probably uh, be taught differently how to ride a bike. And a student who doesn't know how to, how to ride a bicycle will be taught differently how to ride a motorbike. So this kind of uh, the background information, the, the whole idea in psychology and education earlier we used to call transfer of learning from one system to the other. Even machine learning has this idea of transfer of learning. So transfer learning has been incorporated very much into the deep learning and artificial intelligence methods today. So this uh, kind of knowledge has to be in, internally in our database systems, in our informatics and analytics systems have to be modeled. And this can give, a, give the teacher some guidance about how to tailor make their contents. And that is where the teacher's role is to provide. Now, these are the guidelines. These are the key points that our data system, our AI based system is providing. How can I modify my content and lecture in such a way that the student gets the best opportunity to learn and then maximize his, uh, his chances to learn and also maximize his interest in your class. So now many data analytics systems will monitor a particular online course, how the attendance is changing. When the student join, when uh, they start the lecture, there are 1000 students. By the time the course ends and the last lecture, the lesson of the lecture, only 100 remain. That means 90, there is a 90% dropout. So dropout, which was very much as part of the exercise done in the physical classroom in the traditional school is also there in the online schools. So now based on that, if, if I have the profile, if I have the data and the, uh, prop, uh, the um, background history and the learning experience, the way the student is learning and also the profile of the teacher, I can develop diagnostics. So the diagnostics can be done automatically. And from those diagnostics, a teacher has to develop contents which are uh, which uh, correspond to or which respond to the outcomes of those diagnostic uh, analysis. And third is again, uh, part of personalization, but it is about localization of contents. So if I'm teaching, if, if uh, I suppose I was to take a class on physics today and in the morning I found there's a lot of fog in Delhi, the students who are coming to my classroom should at least discuss a little bit about fog. So, uh, and if, if there is something which is in, uh, I'm teaching and which is related about to fog and how the fog forms and so on and so forth. So this kind of localization of contents and con contextualizing the contents uh, to, will complement the online technology. This kind of di discussions and this ki kind of discourses may not be available online 
they may be available online in a very scattered manner. So teacher's job is not only just to provide new contents on a given topic, but also aggregate the internet contents in a meaningful manner, which are suitable and appropriate for the student who is coming to your class. So it is not, we should not feel scared that all the information is there on the internet. So therefore let's the, let us end the profession of teaching, no. So even the uh, content that is there on the internet, a teacher has to provide a proper guide. He has to collate and aggregate that knowledge. And also he has to provide some kind of a quality assessment of what is there online. So all the information, all the content which is spreading around in the internet is not reliable. And therefore a teacher has to keep a good record of what is there online what the teacher ranks as reliable and what the teachers doesn't rank to be reliable. There will be always online methods itself. There will be some digital resources that will help this rank, help ranking this process, but there will always be a need for an expert who can, who can um, kind of grade the online content and therefore recommend to the students the appropriate and reliable contents. So uh, the analytics and classroom that the artificial intelligence and deep learning technologies are going to impact what we teach, personalize the contents, personalize the curriculum design and the method design at what pace. So if, when I mentioned in my early uh, first few slides about Skinner's uh, teaching machine. So Skinner design, he understood that every, every student has a different way of learning and different pace of learning. So the pace at which a student learns so one wonders that a physical uh, classroom is so helpful, a teacher can really take into account the individual te teacher, but online resources are much more capable of doing it. They can provide the content that uh, the, a, le a particular lesson or a particular course, somebody may be capable of finishing in one month and somebody may take three months to finish it based on the time availability, they, based on their ability and uh, the uh, circumstances in which a student is learning. So uh, the personalization and of this uh, content uh, is sometimes possible through the software and sometimes a teacher has to tailor make uh, those methods which are appropriate for his class. So uh, technology has uh, always uh, impacted. I already touched upon this. Uh, so one point that has been often raised and this is always debated is whether the digital medium are uh, really the helpful or they are, they are harmful. And if, and as somebody said, 65% of our population lives in the villages, uh, when we are making our education more on, online oriented, are we depriving them? So I think we are uh, missing certain points. I show you that how the MOOCs are rising in India. But uh, before that, I let me touch upon the rural versus um, uh, urban issues here. So if you look at the WhatsApp usage in 2019, if this is even before the uh, pandemic, there were 227 million uh, users of WhatsApp app in um, India. And uh, in the urban uh, India, there were 200 million users. So there are more users. Of course, the percentage access with, uh, in um, uh, rural areas is relatively small, but thinking that the internet has not reached the villages is perhaps um, not really no, uh, um, having the correct picture of what is happening to the internet penet penetration in the country. Another information I would like to put here uh, in support of the online education to some extent is that the deprivation of the school or deprivation of the rural population to the education is not uh, only in the online or virtual medium. This is in the real physical classrooms also. So we should not think that it is the online education that has deprived the villages. In fact, online education is faster to reach rural areas or remote areas. On the other hand, the physical infrastructure of the physical schools is much slower. So this is what I have a slide from the NSSO data. The number of students who have access to the school in 2014, which is a little older, but uh, the trend has not uh, changed uh, uh, as much as we would have liked to, that uh, at the primary school level, uh, less, how many people have access to primary school within one kilometer of their residence? So out of uh, 1,000, 941 people have access to the primary school and 925 have access uh, in the urban uh, within less than one, one, uh, one kilometer. And uh, 
per 1000 uh, at the primary school it is little higher in the rural compared to the urban because the uh, because of the travel convenience and all so the schools primary schools are closer home in, in this context but if you go to the secondary school you see the situation is so drastic only 367 students have a school within the one kilometer distance in the urban areas they have 727 um, so this is almost uh, the rural is less than half uh, or just about half uh, the uh, per thousand distribution of the schools is just about half in the rural areas compared to urban and if you go to longer distances if you the you would wonder at the secondary school level only 122 people um, so and this uh, 122 people at the secondary level have a school uh, within the one five kilometer do not have access to. So this is about having, not having an access. So seven, seven of them, uh, seven out of 1000 do not have an access within five kilometer of their residence. But in urban, in rural areas, 122 children do not have access to a secondary school within five kilometers. And you, you imagine this becomes even more serious in the context that traveling is not easy in the rural areas. In, in the urban areas, traveling is much easier. So if effective distance is actually even more than five kilometers. So you can, uh, as a rough uh, rule of um, uh, intu intuitively, you would wonder that it is about 10 kilometers for a, an, uh, for a rural school. So if this ratio is seven is to 122, only seven children are deprived of a secondary school within five kilometers in urban areas. Whereas 122 children are deprived of a secondary school within five kilometer area. So this is about uh, 20 times uh, deprivation in rural areas in the physical schools. And when we are talking about the online education, this ratio is not as much. Online education deprivation of the rural areas is much less than this. It is not a ratio is not one is to 10. I showed you some data on the WhatsApp. Uh, so this population ratio is 227 to 205, roughly equal number. And if you uh, now know that the more people live in the villages, so let us say that three times more people live in the villages, this number, this ratio will become one is to three or one is to four. So internet deprivation of rural areas is in the ratio of one is to four, whereas physical secondary school deprivation is in the ratio of one is to 20. So deprivation of the rural areas and deprivation of the uh, people who do not have um, opportunity or denial of opportunity to them to reach to a school in physical space is much more serious than the online space. So one should not wonder, one should not uh, take this moral high ground on the online education just because we are not very uh, fanciful. We don't think that online education, we are, we are uh, scared of the uh, coming technologies. We should not take the recourse and say that online education is going to deprive the rural population. This is absolutely incorrect based on these numbers that I just showed you. Okay, so um, I'm just monitoring my time. Uh, so how the online education is evolving, has been evolving before pandemic, this data is again old 2013. So I'm, I've deliberately kept a little older data so that it should not be seen in the context of the pandemic. This is a kind of natural growth of the online courses. So uh, in the online courses, you will see that 2012 to 13, the number of courses were growing exponentially. So in 2012, there were almost no online courses uh, on the uh, available pl uh, platforms. So if uh, you have number of user accounts is going in hundreds and the number of hundreds of millions actually, and the number of courses which are available are shown in the red here. So there are 250 um, platforms available uh, for um, online education. And out of all the people who were taking the online courses, you would see that uh, India was at the second largest, just second after United States. So out of all the courses that were being taken by students, 27.7% of students came from United States, but 8.8% .8 of students came from India. This is the situation in 2014 and the MOOC co uh, uh, courses. And what are the courses they are studying? One would think that arts and humanities, they can't study, they can only study science lect lectures. No, but 28% of students are actually studying arts and humanities through MOOC, MOOC courses. 30% of students were studying science, 6% mathematics and business courses were online and information technology courses were online. So this is the situation, the proportion of these courses may have altered a little bit, 
but uh, uh, this is the natural growth of MOOC, which is not limited to the development of these platforms and sudden adoption of these platforms universally because of the pandemic and lockdown. So just to put this in a little more uh, recent terms, in 2019, this is the status. The Coursera has 45 million learners, 45 million worldwide. And they are offering 3,800 courses. It is uh, a huge number of courses they have developed. And they have uh, micro credentials and 16 degrees they are offering. edX platform that is being used uh, for this course, they have 24 million users and uh, 2,640 courses. This is a 2019 data. Uh, source is mentioned here, and 10 degree programs, Future Learn and SWAM. These are the numbers that we had in 2019. These numbers are all changing very fast. In our country, we the digital learning process has been pushed uh, strongly, and uh, these numbers are uh, growing very fast. So this, uh, these courses are not just being taken by the urban population. These courses are being taken by everybody and anybody who has access to internet. And taking internet to a remote uh, area is much easier than building a school. And even when you build the schools, I do not have that in my slides. There are so many examples, so many news reports, which say that the, there are so many school, ghost schools in the country, where schools exist only on paper. There, there is a school classroom and the teachers are being, be, being paid salaries, but there, no classes are ever held. So this, uh, even if a student wants to attend the class, there are no teachers available. There, are no, there is nobody in the school, the school never opens. But on papers, these there are thousands of such schools, and there are many reports that have that have come in news reports. You can refer to them. So uh, thinking that online education gives you more deprivation in the rural areas is uh, again uh, this is another uh, repeat of my uh, negation of that argument. So now, if you look at what kind of contents are being used in the online, this top um, panel on this slide shows that online educational videos form 67% of the educational material. And whereas the app and software, there are 65% of uh, the content people are using this. Whereas there are uh, other contents, something like uh, website and content related games, eBooks, Simulation in VR platform is, an, is a topic which is of great interest and that is where uh, um, a lot of work is needed and is going on. Virtual reality or augmented reality based platforms and where the experiments need not be performed in a real classroom and with the help of chemicals, but they can be simulated in, a, in an augmented reality scenario. So many new experiments can be performed which were earlier just impossible to do in the classroom. So these are uh, the kind of uh, scenarios that uh, are happening in the field of online education. There so access questions. Yeah, um, yeah I, I stop here again. Yeah. So I'll take the second break and then you can ask, bring questions. So. Yeah. So sir, uh, any uh, so uh, Dr. Sri uh, Dharan uh, is uh, interested in knowing that how a teacher should be prepared in terms of infrastructure facilities and technology technical knowledge level other than subject knowledge. And what are various resources we can suggest students online? Perhaps, you know, this is one of the pertinent questions that, you know, uh, as an academic one would often wonder that being located in a particular context, wherein, you know, because we all are located in our different educational spaces. So how do, uh, you know, one prepare oneself with that? And, uh, but at the same time, uh, what I am uh, very happy to also see is that here we are on our MOOC platform, here we all are interacting. We are in hundreds and thousands. And I mean, you know, this is what technology does to us and uh, creates our venues. And, uh, and, and just a couple of other concerns have been, uh, which is better technique to teach the students at primary and upper primary school level. Uh, this has been asked by uh, uh, Chandra Prakash Saini. And um, uh, Participants have been, uh, you know, uh, really uh, concerned about the fact that, you know, in rural areas, if one has to speak from uh, the, you know, the slow internet connectivity, uh, you know, hinders the online education. I mean, how would you reflect on that? Okay, so there are a number of issues uh, that have been raised. First of all is uh, the issue of uh, how to tailor make our contents, how to prepare our contents. I have some slides based on that, but let me, I don't know if I'll be able to cover all that I have on my slides. So I'll quickly respond to that. So there are many resources. So generally I group those resources in three ways, how you lecture the classrooms. One is the way you just give a lecture. So here, what you need is a good uh, video editing facility, good recording facility. 
and a good streaming media. So there are uh, many online platforms like YouTube, Instagram, or pretty much every social media provides you some kind of a streaming facility. Some of these topics we have extensively covered in our training programs called VTOM. And uh, if you subscribe to our channel, CyberLab, some of my lectures and others' lectures we, that we have been uh, we have given in VTOM on specific tools uh, such as LMS, et cetera, they are available, you can access them. So this is just an additional information, but in general, so if you just lecture, you can use these video editing software. Many of these uh, sites provide editing features also. So a good recording system is required. Uh, and then uh, second group of uh, apps would be more interactive in nature. How can you do a real time uh, interactive uh, classroom teaching through an online platform such as uh, Zoom can be utilized for example, for this. So, and there are other, mostly all meeting platforms can be used for interactive classroom teaching where the primary mode is basically the interaction, interactive discussion. And many of them also provide uh, you the facility to use something like a whiteboard. So you have a scratch pad and you can use that board to actually write if you are doing something, uh, you, you want to write some mathematics or you want to draw some diagram during your classroom. And you can also actually put your camera directly onto whiteboard. And uh, you know, so there are uh, now digital, digital boards also which can record what you have drawn on the on the what you have written on the whiteboard that can be recorded and that can be played on later on also so there are all kinds of technologies available there uh, for this purpose there are writing pads uh, some companies have developed writing pads and now to aggregate all of that together now people have developed what we call learning management systems which uh, provide a content management so the advantage of content management i will again uh, touch upon this in my uh, slides if possible so advantage is that you have a record of an individual. And if different LMSs across the educational system in the country and worldwide, if they can talk to each other and if they can exchange uh, useful information about an individual, suppose I have a user ID and every course I attend worldwide is connected to, the, to that user ID, then any platform, if I join a new course, that course can access that information and that course can uh, really know a lot about my educational experience. Now, one would wonder whether this privacy information is good or not. That is always a debate, but uh, the, from the user's uh, point of view, if the data is utilized to provide him the best or uh, technical content and educational content, it is quite a, quite a technological advancement, which can be put to very good use. Is there any other question? Uh, there is another one which says that, uh, do you think there is a perceptible gender bias in online teaching learning? Well, uh, I would say, and I gen uh, if I would generalize, most of the biases and prejudices and the access issues are not caused by the online as such. They are there in our society in a different context and they are not, an online system is not free from them. So these biases, uh, if, if your system, if your society is biased in any way, that those biases cannot be eliminated in a digital medium. So um, even people have in the past discussed about what examples we use to teach our students. They may be biased. We might take, are we going to teach, when we are teaching physics, are we going to take example from the, from the well, the well? Or are we taking the example from uh, uh, running um, a Mercedes? So what examples we take are always biased. They have cultural uh, undertones of the person who has developed those contents and those who are delivering them. So definitely there are gender biases and, but these gender biases, I don't say are really specific to online education system. And there are definitely additional challenges like how you come on camera, the way a boy is uh, allowed to sit in front of the camera and the way a girl is allowed to sit are different and there may be uh, because if the education becomes online, a girl may be under more pressure to stay at home and study from there. And the boy may be more allowed to go to the classroom, physical classrooms. So there may be those classes, but I don't think this is introduced by the online platforms. So yeah, online platform is providing a technology. It is up to the society to take care about gender biases and which would auto automatically get corrected in the online system. Right, sir. So we can move ahead. Indeed, you you know very rightly pointed out that how gender is a social cultural construct and certainly will get translated to you know uh, through its various institutions. Over to you, sir. Please go ahead. 
So now, uh, since I have a lot of things, so I was talking about ghost school. These are some example news I have. So 748 ghost schools were discovered in Uttarakhand. There are no students, buildings are shut. So even if the buildings have reached some places there, these are the, this is the status of the, on the real education in 2018, 2020, these news have been keep coming to us. So um, our, my message from this is that uh, uh, it is not the online medium which is bringing the biases, which is bringing about the disparities. The disparities and biases are there in our social system and they have to be corrected, not just in the online system, they have to be corrected everywhere. If we correct it, uh, correct it everywhere, they will get corrected in the online world as well. So JNU with Tom, I mentioned are the initiative, I will not touch upon this too much now. So the, um, I'll go to, um, since I was about to talk about the technology that goes, so let me uh, touch upon how the attendance system is evolving in the classroom, for example. So there are three different methods of attendance, the way attendance is being collected. So, but even before we talk about the attendance collection system, there is a whole debate whether attendance should be compulsory or not. So JNU traditionally has been, um, uh, has stood for having a uh, relatively free system of attendance. The attendance was not compulsory in most of the JNU courses, if I understand it correctly. I have not been a student here, but I think Dr. Rani is here. She can confirm if uh, attendance was not com compulsory in JNU for a long time. Yeah, it was not compulsory. Yeah. So the philosophy of having an uh, attendance not being compulsory is that a student, if the student has a motivation to learn, he or she would come to the class anyway. And if the class is not giving him or her anything useful, why should you force him to come to the class? So attendance is therefore not a measure of your academic performance. Okay, attendance is a kind of policing your activity. Uh, if that, could, that could be one view. And in order to attract attendance to your class, in fact, attendance of in, in your class can be an indicator about how your class is going. If people are not attending your class, maybe you should look at your methodology. Maybe you should look at about the timing of your class. Maybe you are, if you keep your class 8 a.m. in the morning in this weather of Delhi, uh, students are still sleeping because uh, they usually sleep late at night and therefore they get up late in the, uh, in the morning. So maybe you need to change the timing. Just a mere change of time, timing can change the attendance uh, pattern. So this is a very simple thing that you can, you can do. But also about the content, if the student is finding your class to be boring, and if the student is finding that your class is not giving anything innovative, you, can, you cannot perhaps force the student to attend, especially now that the student is paying you for your class. The student is the payer. So a student is now a customer of, uh, of your education. If you look at the education as a commodity, the student is a buyer, and it is the responsibility of the seller to give the best product to the buyer. So it is this responsibility of the teacher to provide the best content that attracts the student and that finds favor with the student. So having made the, that uh, value-based point, I come to the technological aspect of the attendance collection system. So three uh, essential developments uh, have happened in the field of attendance collection. <clears throat> One of them is uh, called RFID based method where the, everybody is given an RFID card. And this can be installed. This is installed at the entrance of the school or anything. So a student doesn't have to mark attendance or anything. He just have to keep the attendance card in his pocket and the attendance will be automatically marked. The only challenge here is that the students may, one student may carry 10 cards and the attendance may be marked for all the 10 cards that are there in one student's pocket. So there is a kind of, uh, this is the challenge in RFID based system. On the other hand, the data collected through RFID can be utilized if the students are recording it honestly. And in many countries I have lived, the students will never do this kind of cheating. One student will never carry two cards. So, but uh, in our country, fortunately our students are smarter than that. And our students may often carry more than one cards at a given time. And uh, therefore, uh, but if the students are uh, trained and the students uh, agree to record their attendance fairly, and if there is no penalty, so if there is no penalty, there will be no cheating. Most people lie because there, there is a cost of telling the truth. So if there is no cost of telling the truth, then probably you will get the, uh, get the truth. 
so the if you can get these students recorded properly then you can utilize this you can have a an internet based system or you can have an app which aggregates the rfi the attendance patterns which students are coming late what are the what are the patterns what is the timing at which the students are more late so you can do data analysis you can do ai based diagnostics and you can actually improve the teaching learning process the entire learning program and then the second type of systems that have come into being which is uh, less prone to the manipulation by uh, is the biometric attendance system management system biometric attendance system you put a thumb and the attendance is recorded so in these two types of uh, biometric systems are there in one case the all the biometric data about you is stored in the system and then the um, technology will be used to match whether your your fingerprint is matching to the database or not so there are some privacy concerns on this so alternative system is that your thumbprints are stored on your card you are given a card <coughs> and you punch both your thumb and your card and if both of them are matching the attendance will be recorded <coughs> so sorry so if you do this in this way you can avoid uh, this uh, uh, having to keep the data of every individual so privacy issues can be um, addressed in this way so this is the second uh, system of attendance and the third system is an app based so you can have uh, something on your uh, on your smartphone and you can utilize this for marking attendance so these are the again these type of attendance marking systems can provide uh, data which is very useful for designing the uh, to for planning the future classes and to plan the lectures and look at the patterns that can be harnessed for improved teaching learning process so in the when you do a classroom management in the physical classroom traditionally what are the various components of classroom that you do you schedule your classes your your examination this is about evaluation and examination so you schedule your examinations you issue hall admit cards you do a question paper and types there are these types of questions and you set time limits you have invigilation you have answer sheet collecting you have scoring results reporting certification and sometimes uh, that is not the end of it you people come back to you for reevaluation retotaling and then you have a challenge of keeping the record and scrapping of answer sheets this is what happens in a traditional classroom traditional means the classroom that existed uh, exists today and until recently and that is where the system has arrived so see how there is so much of work involved in evaluation and assessment and that is where a lot of help is needed from online and digital sources and in the online world this is how it works you have assessments you have online tests you have result reporting all this can be done most of this can be done automatically you can set time limits you can have a user management system you can have a question bank you can have quizzes so storing a question bank is a uh, something which can drastically help uh, greatly help in the in uh, the teaching learning process which is difficult in the physical world and you can have automatic grading you can have randomization of question which is so difficult in without the use of digital media you can also issue certification you can schedule you can have weighted questions so every you have questions and every question may have different marks so when you are looking for a solution for online uh, evaluation system this is these are the kind of features that you should be looking for and you can give surveys you can do question branching so these are the features you have to see whether these kind of features ever are available in the system or not so what ai does i just uh, because a uh, lot of uh, try content so i put a little poem here which says about how artificial intelligence can be used here mimicking brain shallow and deep machines are learning letting man sleep without complex equations or laws making use of errors and flaws regressive divisive and classifying only in ai are so gratifying so why they are gratifying in ai is because regression the division and classification are techniques of computational methods so that is how we solve computational problems with these helps so that's why they are gratifying in ai and that's all where they can be gratifying so okay so we are coming towards the end of the time that is allotted to me so uh, these are the technologies to think about let me choose some of the content that i would like to explain so where are we using artificial intelligence and deep learning or analytics in in education so these are the topics where we are using it they automatically optimize your course content that you have a course content you have hundreds of chapters in your lecture some of these chapters some students do not need some students need some additional courses which are available elsewhere 
So they will automat automatically optimize. They will ask you some questions and they will say, okay, now I have, the machine has designed, artificial intelligence has designed a course for you and you can choose that course. They can create unique customized course content for every student. Every student have, every individual student can have a completely different course to learn in an online system. That is how AI and deep learning can help. And discover the need for new courses or modules. So when you are perform, when you take the first chapter, second chapter, or second or first or second module, based on your how you are performing in this online test, the course can offer you. Okay, I think you you need this course, or you if you if the course finds that you are too good in something, then it can advise you. Okay, you are too good in this. Why don't you take this advanced course? So this kind of discovery of need for new courses, which you may have not thought before that would be available. Earlier, these kind of advices are always available from expert teachers and concerned parents. But this information, this process can be now automated with the help of artificial intelligence. And this can reach wider range of students. In a physical classroom, you can accommodate to have 50 students, 100 students based on what kind of classroom you have. With the help of online systems, we can reach, reach uh, give marketing messages, more people can join. And machines, bots can solve 24 by seven doubt solving for students. There may be already the question that a student is asking in your classroom may not be a unique question. There are millions of students studying the same topic worldwide at a given time. It is unlikely that the, the question that has been raised by your student has not been asked by any of those millions. So if this question has been asked by millions of students worldwide already exists there and a good answer for that already exists and the answer which has already been marked whether it's a good answer or a bad answer by the students, then it can be directly picked up from there, from a bot. So this kind of existing answers, taking from databases with the help of AI, with the help of deep learning is uh, very useful. This can only be provided with the help of technology. And it can also provide interactive immersive learning experience, which is called the augmented learning. So for those who want to learn more, this is a reference I would like to give you emerging edtech.com, which has this uh, interesting primer on machine learning and deep learning for educators. So the questions I'll raise a little bit, I will not be able to discuss much more except uh, through your questions is, uh, can we ask, can we uh, in the future see robots as teachers? So teachers in the virtual class, maybe actually a few, uh, every teacher who is joining the class need not sit on a chair like I'm sitting here. In the future, there will be better places, studios from where a teacher can learn, can give a lecture where there will be some students participating in reality in physical classroom and some students joining online. So these are kind of hybrid classes are already there, but more and more of this we will see. We can do uh, simulations of the experiments instead of actually doing the experiments. Many impossible experiments can be designed and uh, I was saying in my earlier lecture on a similar topic that many people are now becoming artists without, uh, without ever touching a brush. Our children are drawing, making very be beautiful paintings with the help of uh, these um, online tools. So it is uh, also true for chemistry, for mathematics, where people can do simulations and see what will happen and they can create scenarios and find answers for situations which they cannot create in a physical world. So this is the idea of the virtual lab where the whole uh, entire experiment has been designed in a virtual mode. And people may think they are in uh, the universe, they are going through the, so earlier efforts in this direction was, if you remember, there are planetariums and people would go to a planetarium and they can see, okay, this is a particular star, this is a constellation, this star is here and so on. They could have an immersive experience of the universe. So this has been there for a very long time. Now it has become much more available. This technology has become accessible to many more people and in, uh, and in many more areas. So you can actually create uh, um, many different, um, not only the universe, you can create chemicals. You can say, okay, if you put uh, sulfuric acid on metal, what will happen? So you do not have to use a test tube and put metal and then sulfuric acid on top of it. You can just do it uh, by the click of a mouse and see what is happening. So these kind of thought, any thought experiments can be designed. So these kind of virtual labs are going to be a very important component of the future of our classrooms. So I skipped this, uh, I already touched upon this. So then I, these are the list of some of the online platforms that are available. 
So LMS is, I was talking, so the, Dr. Rani currently mentioned that we at JNU developed this um, uh, on, complete learning management system called Teacher Metrics. So this has uh, something like what you would also may have some of you who have used other learning management systems like MOOC or in, uh, like LMS and others. So many of these are commercial uh, learning management systems which provide you the um, basically these three things. A learning management system gives you the ability to create courses. It allows you to manage your students who are attending your classes and who are, uh, who are your audience and also provide you marketing and promotion strategies. But on top of this, the learning management systems provide you data for AI-based teaching learning and tailor making your contents later on. So in this uh, one particular thing uh, in the end, I would like to mention is how we can utilize the data. Is, this is the last uh, topic that you, I, uh, I like which is not often mentioned and for the developers, the learning management systems or online platforms that we use for teaching learning must have what is in computational language called interoperability. So interoperability refers basically that data which is developed or the management systems utilized for teaching one course and another course is using another learning management system, how they can exchange information with one another. Exchange of information is important for developing diagnostics and developing the optimized content that has, as I have been highlighting in today's lecture. So these are some of the efforts which have been made earlier. One is uh, uh, X API. So ideally learning experience should be managed as a part of a cohesive career long continuum. So this is what, when we are saying optimizing content, it should not be that I'm doing my master's program right now, but my master program is completely blind to what I studied in my plus two. And it is completely blind to who was my teacher in plus two. I had a horrible teacher to teach a particular subject X. And therefore I need some kind of a compensation on that particular account in the current class. So if therefore every individual should experience, should have a cohesive experience of learning. It should not be just a collection of individual lectures or a collection of individual uh, courses that you are attending. A cohesive experience can be provided through the computational and AI based and inter, uh, the, this AI can be enabled only if there's an interoperability between the databases which are generated in the process of our teaching learning process. And uh, the sharing the relevant data access in, to different education and training program, programs and management systems. So this is a need I highlighted. And then um, I mentioned this, uh, so you can always refer to more of this. There is a, an initiative called S SCOM which stands for shareable content object reference model. It's a technical standard how we should, I mean, when a developer is developing uh, an LMS or they are storing a lecture in the backend, how to write the information about the individual. If they just write free information, there is no computer can autom cannot automatically integrate that information. So, so certain standards are required and these standards have been developed as an initiative by, taken by um, some uh, US uh, authorities and SCOM is those standards. So I just stop here and um, I open myself, uh, I, I let the questions come in again. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, such a thought provoking, uh, you know, uh, interactive session on future of classroom. So not only just, you know, you've reflected on how, you know, uh, technology has, you know, penetrated in almost all, uh, you know, spheres of our lives, you know, move, uh, beginning it from, you know, the classrooms to the other aspects as well. And, uh, and indeed, uh, you know, very interestingly, you've, you know, also reflected on that, uh, you know, uh, this uh, sort of, uh, you know, I mean, I as an academic feel that uh, the major question now is how creative we are as an academic while, uh, you know, engaging with this, you know, technology in our classroom setup, which is certainly is, is, is beyond, uh, you know, the walls that uh, one is talking about learning which moves beyond the four walls and has to be engaging and yet has to create a dialogical space right there for your learners and of course we participate as co-learner rather than being just into the category of being authoritative as I'm reminded of Paulo Freire's you know uh, categorization of 
you know, uh, in, in his work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, that, you know, uh, we uh, as a teacher, it's, it's, it's our, uh, you know, prerogative and our role as an academic, how, uh, you know, uh, meaningful we can make that learning process for our, you know, learners as well. So there are a couple of questions. Um, so one is about, uh, I think, which we all have been grappling with as a parent, as a, you know, a co-learner in the process, or for that matter, if one can categorize as a teacher, that how students are getting addicted to gadgets, which uh, we need to think about it. So this is uh, being asked by Sudeep Mandal, who says, you know- I think I, I lost your voice a little bit uh, while you were- uh... Am I audible you, now? Am, am yeah, I audible? Yeah, I, may, I missed part of it. Can you repeat the question? Sure. So I'm saying uh, this question has been put across by Sudeep Mandal. And uh, he is uh, precisely you know, reflecting on one of a, a very uh, pertinent question that we as parents are grappling with and as an academic, certainly. That, uh, and he is placing this uh, in context of school level uh, students that how they are getting addicted to gadgets, which is harmful for their physical and mental uh, you know, health. So you know, he's saying that we need to think about it. So how would you see that? And another one is on uh, the you know on the technical aspect that can we uh, have an alternative to Google Forms to conduct online exams? Okay, so first part is uh, how to deal with the addiction. Of, uh, so first, uh, I would take this position. Sometimes we over, uh, we are judging their addiction too much, maybe. So yeah, I would like to just try to clarify this a little bit. That we should, if our uh, children, uh, our students are using online media more frequently, we should not assume they are getting addicted all the time. Yes, uh, I'm not saying that this problem does not exist, but uh, the amount of time they spend on digital uh, devices, say your smartphone or uh, laptop or computer, uh, is not always useful, useless. So uh, first of all, we have to first diagnose the problem correctly. Are they really addicted, or it is because we are little irritated that why they are using internet more than us. So first we have to really correctly diagnose it. Yeah, having said this, yes, there are addiction issues. And uh, I often say that the problems of the digital world are not very different from the problems of the real world. I'm not an expert in this field. So I'm just, uh, my view may not be the ultimate view and not uh, uh, the final view. And somebody may correct me, uh, I'm, most, I'm most welcome that. But uh, I, my thinking is that uh, the problems of the online world are very similar to the physical world. Addictions exist in the real world. Addictions exist also in the online world. Some people say that there are social media addicts and people are always looking for the likes. And recently I was talking, discuss, discussing this with my students. So I was giving, you, uh, giving them the example that this kind of social addiction is not limited to online. If I go to my old city and I find there are lots of people who are just sitting, loitering, hundreds of people, tens of people, dozens of people are just sitting there, just uh, doing nothing. And they may have important work at home or in office, but they just can't leave because they are addicted to each other. So this kind of an addiction uh, may become uh, more prevalent on, in the online because the access to online uh, society or online uh, social systems is easier than the physical world. So that is the only thing that, that changes. Uh, why people would be more addicted in an online system and not addicted to uh, sitting uh, outside in the street is partly, or sitting with friends or playing sports with friends. Why they would be more, more addicted to an online game and not in a real physical game. So uh, part of this is that it is easier to access an online system and therefore uh, this is, um, this becomes easier to become addicted to them. So solutions would be similar. And this, this uh, to provide them the best, better content and uh, to utilize the co-opt these technologies to provide uh, uh, the uh, um, materials in the online systems, which can be useful for them and providing them alternatives, which are uh, more interesting. So, and also engaging with them. So if, People have no, no other way to go. You have to find, give them interest and you have to give them alternatives. Human brain wants, to, brain wants to be busy all the time. And if there is no other way to engage your brain, then that they will go to the easiest way to engage your brain, their brain. And that is the social media. 
because social media is alive 24 hour 24 by 7 whereas us parent and us uh, siblings may not be available all the time so having alternative uh, options for the, for our youngsters and for ourselves may be a way to go but i would uh, still say that all this social uh, media access and social media activities are not to be seen in a, in a negative way we have to really know whether it has reached the addiction level and when it has reached the addiction level we have to take the corrective measures so uh, so i mean would you uh, you know would you i mean how would you see i mean do you do you also feel that this is indicative of the fact that you know that uh, children or for that matter adults getting addicted to gadgets social media or online platforms more perhaps due to the uh, you know um, uh, the increasing disharmony in human relationships and disintegration at some point of time I don't know. I mean, I don't work in the area of social conflict, but um, my, in my humble view, I, I don't think that the gadgets create more disharmony. And uh, I, disharmony can be created in, in a real world as well. Disharmony in terms of physical world I'm talking about, that human sure. relationships, uh, in terms of human relationships, that is getting implicated, uh, you know, through people getting more addicted to gadgets or perhaps no, the first beyond the I, I'm always, minimum usage. I'm, I'm always careful uh, in, first of all, I, as I stated my answer to the previous question also, I'm always careful uh, in, before I label somebody addicted, I really want to know whether he's really addicted. Just spending more time than me is not addiction. If I'm spending two hours and somebody else is spending five hours on the internet, I cannot call that person addicted. I can call, uh, so there are certain, I think psychologists have a better way to define what, it, what is addiction and diagnose whether this addiction has reached clinical levels or it is just uh, kind of uh, people get more attached, attached to them. I mean, uh, some of these addictions may not be bad if they're not doing anything negative. So, I mean, we are, we are addicted to human relations. Children may be addicted to their parents uh, and uh, a child may not go to his mother and uh, may only go to his father or vice versa. So they're not addictions. It is just their uh, preferences and they, that is where they would want to interact more. So kind of uh, when it reaches a clinical level, that has to be diagnosed properly. And uh, we should not always assume uh, that they're addicted to it. But yes, because uh, social media gives you a lot of exposure. The physical world does not give you that much of an exposure. And it, is, uh, it can be more intense and uh, you may be getting variety of experiences. But uh, if uh, the media are used judiciously, th that keeps you informed. So the idea is to give them the guidance on what is the right content, what is the wrong content, which new sites to believe, which new sites are fake, how, and to develop the culture of verifying the information they are receiving. And also to uh, develop the culture of choosing the right friends and making them secure. So there are many issues. It is not just about addiction. It is about the issue of uh, security. It is also about this issue of privacy. It is about uh, the data uh, sanctity and data reliability, the information that we are ac accessing. So we are more and more in that uh, basically if, uh, one risk that I definitely see is that uh, if our world, our uh, interactive world is, has a greater component of online or virtual world and less component of the physical world, there is a possibility that I am, I am uh, influenced by marketing strategies rather than the real strategy. So if I may, be, uh, buy, I may buy a product because somebody knows how he can make me buy. And if I'm, uh, that means I'm not going by the quality of the product, but by the marketing strategy of the product. So there is a, definitely a possibility that my mind, my decisions, my choices may be influenced by the way I interact on the social media. But for that, the answer is not to take away the, the, these devices from them. The answer to that is to educate them to judiciously and correctly and smartly use what is available on the, on, in the uh, virtual world. A virtual world has everything. You have to ultimately make choices. First, this is true for all societies. When the civilization came into being, people were exposed to all kinds of social, uh, social possibilities uh, from the worst to the best. And the society ultimately decided to form some kind of a balance and we became civilized people. So same way in the virtual world also, there may be a lot of uncivilized behavior, but ultimately that society will also learn to be civilized. So that is my hope. 
Uh, thank you so much, sir. And there are a couple of more questions. One is, uh, should government uh, change whole education system into online mode? Uh, if you could provide your valuable suggestions. And apart from that, there are a couple of more questions, so I'm taking them right away. Uh, Chetali Pal says that how uh, can one uh, you know, motivate our students and our colleagues who are unwilling to adopt this new method of online teaching learning process? Uh, and uh, you know, and and the reality and the fact remains that we are closely associated uh, with our colleague and our learners, you know, uh, in our day-to-day -day basis in every possible way. And then Lena Wig uh, uh, says that uh, we all are headed towards digital and online world, whether we accept it or not. But uh, we need to, uh, you know, what about health impact of students and teachers sitting in front of a screen for long hours? So these are a few of the questions. Okay, so there are three questions. One question is, should we move entirely to an online educational system? I mean, this is a policy decision, but as uh, academics, what are our views on this? So uh, I don't think the technology will completely replace the real classrooms. And there will be, uh, as I showed you in the, one of these classes, uh, one of these slides, that there will be a hybrid system. Some students will join online, some students will come, come in person, or some contents will be provided online, some in person. So I don't foresee that in the near future that the physical classroom is going to disappear. And uh, I also don't see uh, foresee that uh, the online education will disappear. So they have to learn to coexist. Technology has to be co-opted and they have to go side by side, but we have to um, carefully assess what is the best medium for a given topic, for a given people, and for a given situation scenario in terms of uh, social impact, in terms of economic impact, and in terms of the uh, learning, teaching learning um, efficiency. So this is the thought for the first question. And second question was, how can we motivate our colleagues who are reluctant to go on board with the technology? So I know people, some of uh, our friends who never use a smartphone. So the technology brings about a change in our system, in our ambience, in our um, social environment, which we are not necessarily quick to adapt. If these people were born in a time when the smartphone was given in their hand right at the age of two years, when they were two years old, the same people who are uh, refusing to use a smartphone today would have been very familiar with this. So it is uh, what we call transfer cost. So when we are uh, used to one particular lifestyle or one particular mode of uh, interacting with our world, uh, and we are given an alternative and we have to transfer to a new technology, a new system, there is a particular cost to us. Some people are not willing to pay that cost, but system will not wait for them. The online technology will not, cannot be stopped because there are activists who say that online education is bad. Technology will stay. Technology cannot be held back. That it is only people who can adapt this technology, improve this technology and make, the, make this technology really useful and uh, acceptable. So technologists have to work on the concerns raised by people who are opposing technology and people who are opposing technology have to also come forward. So the efforts have to be made on both sides. So this answer to a technology, which is seen as bad, which is seen to have problems such as social problems or psychological addiction, et cetera. See, answer is not to stop the technology. Answer is to find better technology. Answer is to find uh, new technologies which can address the concerns of the current uh, uh, technology. So they will always come from technology. They will not come by giving up technology. It has never happened, I often say this, it has never happened in the history of mankind that humankind came to know about a technology and they gave up the technology and they said, okay, we don't want this technology. It has never happened in the history of mankind as far as I know. And therefore it will not happen in the digital world also. The technology that has come will stay. The challenges will be identified, solution, the problems will be identified and then there will be new technology to address those problems and challenges. If people came to learn about uh, surgery, in the beginning, when surgery took place, there were there could have been uh, there must have been a lot of deaths and a lot of wrong surgeries may have taken place. But it did not mean that surgery stopped. People found better ways of surgery, and people found better ways of medication. So uh, technology or the flaws of technology can only be corrected by a better technology. 
Thank you so much, sir, for uh, you know very very engaging you know reflection on uh, the idea itself, and of course also you know while uh, responding to the very interesting questions that were put across by our you know fellow colleague here from across the country. And indeed, yes, you know how rightly you've you know we've pointed it out that it's for us uh, as human beings, as somebody who's who is us. We all are located in a social context, so we are social beings. So how humanistic we can make you know technology is is perhaps you know uh, for us to uh, you know think and rethink and explore. And uh, and you rightly pointed it out that learning has to be personalized. Where your social learner is placed. You know, so you decide your pedagogical, uh, you know, methods. So you decide um, integrating it with, uh, you know, uh, the need of the R that is technological aspect. And uh, so very, very thankful to you, sir, for having agreed to be with us and, uh, you know, uh, and for such a meaningful uh, deliberation. And uh, I, on behalf of, uh, you know, uh, our respected uh, principal, Professor S.P. Agarwalji of uh, Ramanujan College, uh, Delhi University. Uh, thank you from core of our heart. Also on the behalf of uh, the program director, Dr. Nikhil Rajput, and uh, respected other faculty members present here, uh, Dr. Rati, Shubhra, Dr. Pathak, uh, Dr. Homer, and also on behalf of, uh, you know, all the academia, I mean, you know, who have joined this faculty induction program six from, uh, you know, different parts of the country for such uh, engaging and such meaningful questions that you all, uh, you know, have put across, uh, which, have ha which has, you know, helped us making this, uh, you know, whole interactive session a very, very uh, enriching experience for each one of us. So on that note, uh, thank you so much, sir. So thank you. we look forward to have you more now. Thank you very much. For your thank you for your questions. Thank you so much, sir.